Welcome back to Black News Tonight. As we continue our celebration of Black August, honoring the freedom struggles of the past and present, the question arises, what role do white people have to play in the fight for justice and equality? Books like How the Irish Became White by Noel Ignatiev or The Invention of the White Race by Theodore Allen were revolutionary almost for getting people to examine whiteness as a social construct. And of course, we owe a huge conceptual debt to the great W.E.B. Du Bois, who raises the question around the psychic and psychological wages of whiteness and black reconstruction in 1935. So black folk did that too. But many would argue that my next guest has been just as influential as anybody in recent moments. The best-selling author of White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism. Well, she has a new book. It's called Nice Racism, How Progressive White People Perpetuate racial harm. Joining me now is Robin D'Angelo. Robin, always good to see you. The title of the book, Nice Racist. What is a nice racist? A nice racist is me. A uh, nice racist is the more implicit end of the continuum. It's really easy and clear to recognize explicit acts of racism. Uh, but but black folks are under undermined every single day by people, white folks with smiles on their faces. Uh, and yet there's an outcome. And I wanted to challenge this very familiar narrative that whenever a white person is accused of racism, uh, they usually are defended with the claim, he couldn't be racist, he's a really nice guy, right? So this idea that niceness uh, and uh, collusion with racism are mutually exclusive. Why the term racism? Your subtitle talks about racial harm. There are people who will say, well, I can concede that I do racial harm. I mean, we all do harm. And if it happens to racialize the minoritized people, I can I can own that. But when you call I, when you call me a racist, I don't want to own the title or the identity of racist. What do you say to those people? Well, I mean, it was a strategic choice, right? If nice racism gets your attention, I don't want to lose it right at the get-go with uh, calling you a racist. <laughs> I think that if you uh, understand what I'm saying, you would understand why I might say that. Uh, but most people have a really simplistic understanding of what that means. I, I really wish more white people would ask themselves, what is the criteria by which I would grant that somebody is racist? And it will usually come down mm. to, uh, conscious dislike and intentional meanness. And I don't know that you could have come up with a more uh, effective way to protect the system of racism than that definition, which again, exempts virtually all white people from that system and pretty much guarantees we're gonna be really defensive about any attempt to connect us to it. Are all white people racist? <laughs> Well, before I answer that, um, I would say it depends on what that means to you. If, if being racist means conscious, intentional dislike and meanness, then no. Uh, are all white people, have we all uh, internalized racist ideology? Yes. Uh, do we move through the world with a racialized experience that benefits us within a uh, system of inequality? Yes. Uh, do all white people on some level have some investment in a system that is comfortable and benefits us? I would argue, yes, we do. Uh, so all of us are part of that system and we are on the uh, end that benefits from that system. Chapter two of your book uh, is called Why It's Okay to Generalize About White People. Uh, one of the things that white people often say is, well, you can't say that about all white people. Robin, you can't say all white people have internalized anything. You can't say that all white people do this or all white people feel like that. And they would say even that the very claim that all white people do anything is itself racist. And that's why it's chapter two. <laughs> uh, it was clear to me after white people <laughs> that I had to take that off <laughs> right away. Um, so, first of all, I'm a sociologist and I'm quite comfortable generalizing about uh, a group of people uh, and describing patterns that are observable and well documented. And that is what I'm talking about, our patterns. Uh, there are exceptions to every pattern, uh, but I want us to try to look at the rule rather than the exception. And I've noticed, and you may have noticed too, that any out you give to white people on this, uh, they will take. And so I wanna push us over to the collective experience. Of course we are each individuals, and I don't know my readers, 
but we are also members of social groups. And by virtue of my membership and your membership in these two different groups, white, black, we could literally predict whether you and your mother and me and my mother were going to survive our births. That is how significant mm. it is to be a member of these racial classifications. And we're swimming in the same water, in the same culture, receiving the same messages. I'm asking white people to be willing to suspend a little bit their focus on how different they are and be willing to grapple with the similarities, the patterns. And any moment that a white person thinks, well, this thing, you know, X, Y, Z about me that you don't know, exempts me from whatever you are saying, I would ask them to ask themselves, how has being white shaped how you experience X, Y, and Z, because it does shape how we experience what we think of as unique to ourselves. It's a interesting thing to be in this juncture in history talking about this stuff, especially on this show. We've been sort of ground zero for critical race theory debates. Uh, and I've had everybody on here from Christopher Rufo to James Lindsay to Vernon Jones, uh, Liz Wheeler. We, we've run the gamut and it, there seems to be a consensus among that sector of the population that certain types of race talk is not only troublesome, but potentially immoral. Uh, they've said that critical race theory in schools is a moral panic. It's a crisis. It's something that needs to be legislated against. I just had uh, Representative Christiansen from Utah here last week who said to me that they have to uh, legislate against this stuff being taught in school. What do you say to people who are on that side of the critical race theory and education debate? Well, I wouldn't try to say here's what critical race theory really is because I don't think people are engaging at, at a rational level. It is the new boogeyman. Uh, the white populace has always been uh, susceptible to manipulation around racial animus. I, I assume you're aware of the Southern strategy. This is the latest manifestation of it. Uh, critical race theory, it, it's perfect in a way. Uh, you know, it's just vague enough. Uh, that you can attach just about anything to it. But what it comes down to, and the reason that I am called a critical race theorist, even though technically I am not a legal scholar, what it comes down to is any acknowledgement that racism exists, that it is real, uh, that the country is founded in it, and that it is infused across all of our institutions. That is going to be seen as critical race theory. And there are very, very, very deep investments in the status quo. Uh, and, and it's just it's just a very effective way at getting us not to have the conversations that we need to have. Uh, th these conversations aren't what is dividing us. Uh, you just had India Walton on. Uh, Buffalo is one of the most segregated cities uh, in America and has been for a very long time. It's not talking about race that led to that segregation and division. Before you go, Robin, I have to ask you this. There's been a, a push uh, in some sectors of critique of you, uh, not just white <laughs> scholars of race in particular, but you in, in particular. Uh, they mm -hmm. framed your your scholarly and, and writerly interventions as being opportunistic, that you're making money off of black pain, that you are that you are taking up space that should be reserved for black writers on race, that there's something problematic about how you approach the question of race, racial scholarship and race talk in general. What do you make of that? Well, the investments in protecting the status quo are deep, but so are the investments in challenging the status quo. Um, and, and I understand that that angst about uh, strategy and how it is done and those concerns. Uh, what I would say is that uh, over the last five years, 32 books on race have been in the New York Times bestselling list, and 29 have been written by black people and three by white people. So it's simply not true. Uh, that people are not reading black authors and black scholars. Uh, I've been doing this for 25 years. Um, I didn't just jump out uh, and take advantage of an opportunity. I make my living from anti-racist education. Um, I, I, I wish everybody had to integrate an anti-racist lens into whatever it was they did. I think we would have a much more racially just world. Robin D'Angelo, thank you so much for your insightful comments. As always, it's great to talk to you. Great to see you. Everybody, the book, 
is in stores everywhere. You can buy them anywhere books are sold. But of course, it's always good to buy them from an independent black bookseller. I know one. It's called Uncle Bobby's.